Good evening. It's been a long day and a lot of fun, I think. Graham asked me to introduce my friend and colleague, Ed McGrady, who's going to give us a very interesting keynote. Ed has been at CNA for 25 years. I first worked with him in a game that I designed with others to look at the U.S. Navy's shipbuilding program in the U.S. shipbuilding industry many years ago. Ed volunteered to be an analyst. He almost immediately took over as a player. I discovered later this was fairly typical. Ed's background in gaming began as a role-playing gamer. I'm a board gamer. Ed's an RPG guy. We turned out to be very complimentary. So much so that when Ed was given the opportunity to direct the team at CNA that is responsible for CNA's wargaming programs, I was happy to work under him because I sure didn't want to run it. <laughs> and it's a good thing because Ed's done a spectacular job in that, in that job, and he's going to give you some really interesting insights tonight. Ed. Yeah, I, I remarked to Peter that a lot of people that seem to come back from the gaming session, he said, well, they did come back because they're waiting for dinner. So uh, uh, I, will try to, I will try to make this relatively, relatively uh, brief and painless. One of the things that seems to be a, a common theme in these lectures or these talks is a, a disclaimer up front, but since I'm the guy that owns Wargaming at CNA or the Center for Naval Analysis, uh, I, I think what I say is sort of the opinion of CNA about, about gaming. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's definitely not the opinion of the United States Navy uh, or the Department of Defense. Uh, so uh, they asked me originally to, uh, to talk about why war games work. That's a paper that Peter and I did a while ago, and, and in addition to thinking that was kind of something we rehashed, we'd already read a paper on, and I wanted to do something kind of new, uh, I, I also was puzzled by a lot of things, and one of the things I was particularly puzzled about was sort of the reaction that Peter has talked about in his talk uh, to wargaming suddenly becoming cool. It's not like we suddenly became cool, uh, <laughs> kids suddenly discovered wargaming, and so I wanted to kind of think about that a little bit, uh, but more deeply, I think that I wanted to also talk about my favorite theme, which is the art versus the science of wargaming, uh, particularly since I knew Stephen Downs Martin would be in the audience, but he's not, so he's trying to avoid me. Uh, but I think that when up on thinking about the idea of the art and science of wargaming and the tension that exists between those two sort of poles of creating uh, and analyzing or understanding wargames, uh, I think that gets to some of the issues involved in why war games work. And so I wanted to think a little bit about that. So this talk sort of covers those various topics uh, in, in several, different, several different ways. The first thing I wanted to do is, is this was mostly for Stephen. Uh, Stephen, Stephen I view as the prototypical scientist in war gaming. Uh, that, that apparently uh, Distal uh, and the Your Majesty's government agrees with me that war gaming is an art, not a science. So uh, we can start off from that as evidence that my view of wargaming as art is correct. Well, um, important people have discovered wargames, uh, and it's turned out not to be the sort of glittery rainbows and unicorns uh, kind of situation that we kind of thought it was. In fact, uh, even the work memo, if you read it as I did, as I did as Peter was talking, and I sort of pulled this quote out, uh, simulations and other techniques. Otherwise, otherwise known as wargaming. Why would you phrase it like that? <laughs> Why not just say wargaming? Why do you have to caveat it so much? So this is part of what I was thinking about I was, as I was doing this, uh, doing this talk. Is there seems to be this idea that wargaming is somehow suspicious. That it's some sort of complex black sorcery that we engage in uh, that really isn't valid or isn't uh, verifiable, can't, can't go through the DMV process. Many things like that seem, seem to overtake wargaming. And so why do people think about that? And, and one of the things we saw up here was the die rolling issue that came about. And so I'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, these two illustrations sort of illustrate my concept in the, in the upper, your upper left corner of how war games and war game design works. And in the lower right corner, my impression of the Stephen Downs Barker scientific method uh, for designing and, and running war games. And, and it's really not an opposition as much as two different perspectives 
on the same crop. We're both looking at things uh, in different ways. But when we start talking about why don't war games work, I immediately, the part of our paper that was on why war games work, that was really mine, was a whole narrative issue. I saw war games as a kinesthetic narrative that people act out uh, and that that engages them in different ways. Uh, we heard some of it from, uh, from Tom with respect to how the brain changes when you think about things as in a role, vice, uh, vice just thinking about things uh, as an abstract spectator. Those things are very important. And so I think our first paper, our paper dealt with it as a, as a narrative. But on the other hand, I don't think the narrative idea really deals with what I call the counter-rationalist argument, or the whole war games as science argument, as effectively as it, as it could. And, and one of the things that I see is that, is that I want to explore the idea of the other part of war gaming that I see, and its role in what I call, what I call the counter-rationalist narrative, or the counter-scientific counter narrative of war games as these objects that we design in a mathematical or technical sense, uh, but instead I want to claim that they have a component that is different. And part of that component is narrative, which I'll talk about, but the other part of that component is play. And I think play is one of the keys that unlocks a lot of the things that we're seeing with regard to how people think about war games. And I don't think necessarily people think play is good. Uh, so I had some questions when I started this. Uh, why do I believe war games are special? I think war games are a special thing. I think that war games and games in general are something that changes people, because I've seen it. I've had people engage in fistfights in my games. I have people have complete changes in their view of issues and complete changes in how they view themselves in the context of the game. So I think games are very powerful and they do a lot of very interesting things. Everybody in this room who plays games kind of knows what I'm talking about, right? You get wrapped up in the game, you get going in it, and you really, really want those dice to come up with ones instead of sixes. Um, the other question is, is, is that I think, again, this came up a lot uh, in the last few, uh, last day, uh, is why do my sponsors keep making me call it something else? An interactive simulation, uh, a simulation, an exercise, an event, anything but a game. They don't like the word game. You know, we talked a lot about the war gaming duality of the, of the two words stuck together, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Uh, but they don't like the idea of games. Uh, and, and also, why do these guys talk so much about dice? You know, they were worried, everybody's really worried about die rolling. Okay? They don't like die rolling. And in fact, in one of my games uh, with some, some very senior flag officers who also had their, their master chiefs or master, uh, master sergeants there, uh, they started rolling the dice and doing the usual stuff. And, and they started you know, not having good rolls, as occasionally sometimes happen. So they immediately brought the enlisted guys in and had them start rolling the dice. <laughs> <laughs> so they, we don't want to touch the dice. <laughs> we will have them roll the dice so it's not our responsibility. There, there's, there's something scary going on here. And I claim there's something going on more than just the obvious. I think there's something going on underneath all this. And I think that it has to do with this fear of, of sort of the scary word of play and the scary word of games. And games are play. And so I think there's something else going on here. I want to try to pull the string on that a little bit. And then finally, why are programmers, modelers, and program analysts inclined to challenge war gaming as some sort of sorcery? Uh, I, I think obviously there's a uh, Obviously, there's a bureaucratic fear inherent in all this. I think that's, that's, a, that's a really important reason. But I think there's something else going on, and I'll talk a little bit about that as well. Uh, uh, where gaming is gaming. Uh, one of the things that I thought about initially as I was, I was doing this, this talk is that core gaming is a really unusual compound word. We don't have war analysis. We don't have war modeling. All we have is war gaming in the military, right? You don't caveat these other activities with the, with the word war. And so I started thinking about, OK, well, uh, it comes from Grinchspiel, obviously. So maybe it was just a, a tactile thing. But then somebody had to say, OK, Grinchspiel. They didn't have to just say Spiel. They said Grinchspiel. Uh, and so maybe there's something else going on here. What, what I think is really going on is that this idea of gaming takes people out of their usual environment. And it takes them into this 
foolish environment, and they don't like that. It scares them. And so they have to find some way to modify the word gaming and to say it's more serious and it's more rational, to bring it in from the artistic, from the irrational side of thinking into something more rational. And so they peg this idea of war onto, ga onto gaming, and that gives it an up modification to make it okay. We could do war gaming, oh, but gaming is a little suspicious. You see this in industry. When you try to sell games to industry or talk about uh, uh, games with industry, as opposed to the war fighting, they want to call it war gaming. A lot of times they really want to call it war gaming, and it doesn't make a lot of sense because they're not really gaming war, but what they're trying to do, I think, is trying to modify, modify, uh, modify the word game. And I think a lot of it has to do with the social implications of play. Well, what are war games? And that's, that's, I think, where we start at looking at war games as play. You know, we have these definitions, which we can go into ad infinitum. Uh, Dr. Perla says it's about decisions, which is true. War games are about decisions. But the first word in my definition, which is people making decisions in a simulated environment, where they can see the consequences of those decisions, is people. War games are more than just decisions. They're more than just the simulated environment the scenario, and they're more than just the way you show them what the consequences are. They're about people. And when you add people in, we have players, and players play. War games are also about play. Not just simulation, not just scenario. And so I think that that is an important component of understanding what war games are, and why I think war games fall into the more artistic category uh, than the more straightforward rationalist category. Play has been studied a lot by psychologists. If war games have this component of play, we can understand play. Unfortunately, psychologists haven't sort of converged much on what it means to play, but there's some important features of play that I think are, that I think are worth thinking about in the context of war games and gaming in general. First of all, there's a separate social contract. You enter into the play state, when you go in to play a game or you go into play, you enter into a separate social contract. You are all going to pretend that you're landing the battalion at the airfield. Okay? You're, even though there's no battalion going to land at an airfield, you're all pretending that the battalion is going to land at the airfield. And in pretending, and in all the various attributes of the game, the mechanics, the materials, the scenario, all those things come together to allow you to get into a flow state where your attention is focused on this pretend world, on this separate place that is neither reality nor completely fiction, because you're in it. If it was completely fiction, you wouldn't be there. You are there. You're doing stuff. So it's a separate place that you can engage in a flow state. You start thinking in terms of the game. You begin to get fixated on the game. And so many people who play games know what I'm talking about. In addition, there's no real world payoffs in the sense that if I do something in the game or I do something in the play state, I'm actually going to gain something in the real world. Now this is, this is a little bit different, I think, than play. When you play with professionals, you do have what I would call the dramaturgical effect of the image that you're showing. You have this unusual situation where the image that you're showing of a professional self, you know, the suit, the briefcase, I'm in charge, I know what I'm doing, is at the same time countered by the fact that in the play state, you're not that guy, you're doing, or a gal, you're doing something else. And so you have to maintain sort of that, that vision of yourself within the world while at the same time being in the game. And that dichotomy creates some complexities for us in the business games or the serious games kind of problem, but in the entertainment games, that's not as much of a problem. In addition, there's boundaries and rules in a play state. You can't do certain things. For example, you agree to play. If you don't agree to play, you're not playing. And in addition, you're going to play by the rules. Because if you don't play by the rules, everybody, and you get caught, everybody is going to get mad, and you're going to be a pariah. So there's certain rules and social constructs that you have to engage in, in terms of play. All this stuff fits, and I think informs, the idea of what we do in war games. <laughs> but I think at the same time, the rationalist model, by rationalist I mean the simulations, the, guy, the people who think that you can write equations for all this, the people who think that humans are simply agent-based computer programs we have not yet fully explored, those 
rationalist models of behavior and, 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 and the world uh, really don't like play. Because play creates, we, you guys have a term for it, used in our game, it's uh, wizard, wizard wheezies. Wi wizard wheezies. You create wizard wheezies, which I think is a very interesting, if somewhat odd British term. Um, <laughs> but you create these wizard wheezies. You do things that you don't expect, right? You come up with things not only from yourself, not only because you're in the flow state, you're playing, but you're playing with other people. That interaction between people creates different kinds of behaviors and different kinds of solutions that take you out of the existing rule set for how things are. And when you're trying to determine whether you're going to buy the F-35 and how many you're going to buy them, that's a really scary thing for the rationalists who like their models and their numbers. So games are a form of play. Even, even serious games, I believe, uh, are a form of play. And I think play is an essential component of games. That playing the fool, and I'm, I'm using this in sort of a technical term as opposed to just being an idiot, uh, that, that, that foolishness that occurs in the play of the games, I think is a very important one. And in role playing games, I think, I think the suspension of social rules makes games different than what we have inherited from a rationalist, analytical view of warfare. In other words, I think that games are special because you play games, and you play games, and when you play games, you are different than when you're doing other things. That is part of what makes games different, and I think it's part of what makes games work. And so I think that's something we have to look at. In addition to the whole narrative studies aspect of games, I think the play aspect of games is something we really need to think about. But I think that in addition to that, as we talk to the narrative, to the, to the rationalist, analytical crowd, I think we need to think about games as different things. They are not simply a linear extension of models, simulations, and other forms of analysis. Because they involve multiple people in a play state doing things that are foolish, that is very different than a model or a simulation, or even an analysis, depending on who the analyst is. It, it, it's different. And I think that if we think about games as this different territory, we have a much stronger argument when it comes to talking to the, to the rationalist model of thinking about warfare. In other words, in many ways, what does this mean? It means games allow us to get at the irrational in warfare. Games allow us to take into account those things in warfare and other human systems that involve the human, as opposed to models and simulations which involve <coughs> things like counting things, uh, predicting things in physics. Uh, does the radar detect the particular kind of airplane? How many missiles am I going to expend shooting at it? Those are all very valid things for, for models. Where do I put my airplanes, and can I keep my airplanes on station even when I'm losing some? That's a, that's a question for games. So how are, how are games different? I think that games, because they have this play aspect to them, change things and make them scary. They make them scary for people who are trying to develop rationalistic-based programmatic models to buy stuff. Those people were very, very locked down on not having foolish things happen and having their view of the world be predictable. I think games also change the way players view problems through interaction. And I think that's also scary for the people that generate these quotes and try to call war games other things. Because if you're changing the players' minds and the players are the people who are going to buy the F-35s, that is very, also very scary for the rationalist model. We're trying to bring in the irrationalist element as part of games into the argument, and that takes away both power as well as validation for the rationalist model of how we do how things work. I think that is a very scary proposition. So games change the view of the players. They also can change the underlying paradigm of the problem. If you get into a game, a lot of times the players suddenly go, that's not the problem. The real problem is this completely different thing that we have to look at. That underlying paradigm change is an important component 
of the play and the interaction between the players and the interaction of players with the, with the narrative. They also open up and expand the set of possible solutions, which is also a scary thing to do. The more potential solutions you have, the more exotic and very expensive model runs you have to do, the more data you have to accumulate, the more questions, questions you come up with. I think all this scares the rationalists who have invested a lot in existing solutions. Now, I'm not telling you they're going to come up to you and say, hey, I think games are scary. I don't want you guys doing it because it's going to trash my whole programmatic process. But rather, what I think they're going to do is you're going to have these reactions and react in ways that you're seeing in, in Peter's, uh, Peter's, uh, Peter's talk. Well, in addition to play, we also talk about games as narrative. And so there's the players and play and, and their interaction with the game, but there's also the player's interaction with the scenario. There's a player's interaction with the story of the game. And this is something that we wrote up in the paper that is also a very important component of why games work and also, I think, why games are very powerful in both changing the players as well as changing the underlying story behind what they're doing. Uh, this, this stories and, and reading stories and thinking about stories are an academic area that's had some minor amount of study ever since Coleridge came up with his idea of the suspension of disbelief. Uh, it's this idea of being between two worlds of knowing you're in one place, hey, I'm, 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 I'm here uh, in the auditorium, but at the same time, I'm the first brigade opso, and I've got stuff to do in the context of the game. That two-sided view of the world that occurs in these games can have significant impact on people. Tom talked a lot about the fact that if you ask people, there's been a bunch of research done, if you ask people to, to pretend they're somebody and think about what decisions they would make, uh, they make a lot more accurate predictions than people who haven't been asked to play the role. Likewise, if you have someone think about something uh, and, or read something and do an fMRI on them, you find that their brain changes in ways that are consistent with them actually th doing that activity or, or having, that, having that thing uh, in their possession. Uh, again, I think this is, this is all a very important area of research for games. I think I would very much like to stick a bunch of game players in an fMRI and see how their brains change uh, in the process of playing, playing over the games. Uh, but I think that participating in these interactive stories makes games more powerful by, again, asking people to play the role of the battalion commander, the brigade commander, uh, and everybody else. Uh, this role of pretend uh, allows you to understand other people's point of view. And one of the things I get a lot is, Oh, we've got to have a subject matter expert on uh, pick a country, on Mexico. We've got to have a subject matter expert to accurately play Mexico because they know everything there is to know about Mexico. I, I, I challenge that notion. If I give the proper incentives and constraints to anybody from any random selection, they will, in a proper kind of game, they will likely exhibit the same kind of decisions and behavior that the Mexican government will probably make, even though they're not, not an expert. And this is very similar to what the research shows, which is experts have eh, not as good necessarily a time uh, with what Tom showed, not as necessarily good as a, a good time as people, as just students who are put in roles and asked to actually do that. I see that in my games all the time. And so people don't believe me, but they, they nonetheless happens in the games. Uh, and so I think that this, this narrative experience that goes on and the changes that occur in the way you think about things as you play games and interact with the story and also play with the other players uh, has this effect not only on subjects and MRIs and students and psychology experiments, but also on the guys actually playing the game, the general officers, the flag officers, uh, and other people that are participating in the games. And I think that makes them very different than the rationalist models who want to assemble all the facts, run the model, get the data, and then present the model and brief them. There's no, they don't stand a chance against the same information or different information presented in the game because the decision makers have actually done it as opposed to just watched a briefing and heard what, what's going on. So I think there's, there's some element to that too. I think no matter how you think of it, games are special. Whether you think of it from the play perspective, you think about it from the narrative perspective, 
games are a form of kinesthetic narrative creation that really changes the players and causes the players to do different things. I think that games are kind of a shared foolishness. This makes them very different than models and simulations. I think we have to get over the fact that people criticize games for this. That is the power and that is the actual delivery feature of games. That's what games deliver. If you take that away and just make it into models, then you're not going to get that aspect of games. And so I think that I, in some ways, I, I, in, in America we have a, a saying, unloading from the muzzle. Uh, I, I think that in wargaming we're too often holding our fires and not owning up to the specialness of what we do and not owning up to the fact that games are different than the model and simulation guys. And instead we try to talk to them in terms of models and simulations. Well, our games incorporate really accurate models and simulations, and our adjudication is really, really great, and therefore our games are just as good as your models. That is a losing argument, in my opinion. I think we need to claim the special specialness of games and make them something, make them something different. So, are games rational or irrational? Well, I think yes. They are. They're both rational and irrational. I can't do a game that has the wrong fire, uh, fire parameters for a weapon. I can't have the wrong range for a missile. Uh, they, are, they do have an underlying rationalist support structure, which makes the games possible. Because I can't play a game if the players don't believe what is happening. So if things don't work in a normal way, unless I'm doing some crazy uh, crazy, uh, crazy video game uh, that's sort of an indie video game that I'm going to put on the Xbox, unless I'm doing something like that where, where the rules don't matter and physics is, is just a suggestion, I need physics and basic behavior to underlie the structure of the game. That's given. Okay? But that's not all games are. Because once play begins, people become involved and games become irrational. They take the rational and they make it irrational. And that is not bad. Okay? Everybody says, oh, well, it's irrational. That means it doesn't make any sense. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that, that the irrational elements of games are the fact that people are involved and they're doing things you don't expect because they're people. They're cranky. They're mean. They're venial. They're selfish. I do a lot of organizational games. Okay? And Peter always goes, well, how do you design organizational games? Well, I just go down to seven deadly sins. <laughs> because that's, what's, that's what you're really going to base the game on. Because people are slothful, they're venial, they're in it for themselves, they're in it for their own organizations, they will withhold resources. I've been in games where literally I've given someone, who is a very important player in a very important place, I've given someone the clue, okay? But because the organization he was with did not talk to ever, anybody ever, okay, he wouldn't say anything at the meeting, all right? And I'm like, psst, psst, you know, got the clue, you know, it's, it's sort of, it was a terrorism game. You got the clue, uh, and yeah, I do have the clue, that's, that's really nice. And so the, the, the nation sailed on happily without it. Um, so I think that is what games bring that's different than the rationalist piece. So, so I'm not arguing with Stephen, I don't think Stephen and I argue in that sense that there's not a rationalist element to games, but I don't think that's what makes it games. I think it's the irrational. Uh, that makes them games. So, games work because they incorporate narrative and play elements into problem solving. In our, in our paper, what we talked about were narrative elements. How narrative elements can lead you into a situation, we can deal with situations that are, are, are uncommon and surprising. Black swans is what, what they're called. And so we talked a lot about black swans, about, about situations that develop in games that are unusual and, and, and that what the games are, are capable through this narrative process of dealing, of having decision makers deal with these black swans. But I think play element in games creates games, creates black swans internally within the game. And I think those black swans created in the social interaction between the players are what also makes games very powerful and what games what makes games work. Okay. I also think games are special because they're dangerous. They allow us to address people through experience, not just 
uh, slide deck. If you play the game, you have experienced the game. You have made the decisions. They're your decisions. You've rolled the dice. And you've failed. Those are very powerful experiences, particularly for military officers who aren't necessarily accustomed in their normal lives to rolling the dice and seeing a bad outcome. The, the, at least the contemporary US military, is very focused on locking everything down with both science, technology, procedure, process, uh, and discipline in such a way that these kind of mistakes won't happen. Mm -hmm. Now, on the other hand, if you look at recent history, a lot of mistakes do happen. The dice don't always roll in their favor. And so I think games in particular right now are needed to sort of help those officers, particularly the general officers and the colonels, understand that sometimes the dice don't roll in their favor. And so I think that's, that's one reason I think games, it's important to have dice in games. Finally, I think games are a form of magic. I really do. <coughs> the sorcery part is right. It's just not black sorcery. It's, it's really good sorcery. We're the good witch. We create an environment that allows people to experience the magic of losing themselves in the narrative and losing themselves in play in a social situation. That is a very unusual experience. The other place it happens is in movies and, and in books and other forms of visual narrative. Those, but it's different in games because you're actually up, moving around, having the kinesthetic experience. That, that, that action process makes games different than movies and different than novels. And movies and novels already have a significant, uh, significant experiential component in that sense. You can think about it. Uh, when you're reading very, when Lassie dies, right? I'm sure no one in this audience, but many people cry when Lassie dies, okay? Or when Old Yeller dies, right? They know that Old Yeller is not dead. <laughs> it's a movie, for God's sakes. But at the same time, they experience that emotion. It's real for them. Games work in the same way, but only even more so because you're actually standing there and you're actually looking at another person who is having the experience with you. So I, I, one of the things that I think is really important for the gaming community, and I think it's really important that Connections is a part of this, is that I don't think we have serious academic study of games yet. Okay? There are courses and there are people uh, that teach gaming, but maybe in the computer science departments, uh, not as a design curriculum. Uh, in fact, we're trying to get a design for a design uh, MFA started uh, at uh, George Mason University in the design department, in the arts department, not in the computer science department. We're working with the computer science department, but it belongs in the design department, not in the computer science or the operations analysis or industrial engineering departments. Game design is a design art form. It's designed to create the play space and the narrative structure to allow people to have that narrative experience. And in that sense, it's a design problem, not a math problem. And I think that understanding that places it academically, but I don't think we have any research. We don't have people getting stuck in, in, in MRIs. We don't have the philosophical, scientific, and sociological underpinnings of gaming particularly the kind of gaming we do, to make them a realistic academic discipline. That's something that needs to change. I know, I know we have a lot of briefings up here, but we don't start talking about things like postmodern structure of games, about various other aspects of games, uh, such as race, sexuality, all these things that go into games, that could go into games. We don't have that kind of dialogue that serious academics would be having about this kind of problem. I think that is one of the most important things that needs to change to get us into this special space, to get us out of the modeling and simulation world, and to make us into something different. Okay. And I think there are two kinds of research you can do with games. You know, say, okay, that's research about games, but I also think there's two kinds of research you can do with games. There's rational research, which is what a lot of us do, but I also think there's an irrational aspect to looking at human interaction and the way people make decisions internally within games and how they think about their role in games and how they think about each other in games that provides a unique aspect to research. And in fact, uh, we, we heard from the chairman of the sociology department that the games and game-like environments 
are being used more and more in social social science experiments. I actually had the, uh, I taught a course at Kennesaw State University on using games in sociology research as a research tool, and they are very interesting as research tools, but because they are not just a survey. Instead, you take the undergraduates, you put them in a game environment, you get the synthetic experience, you get the narrative, you get the play, you get all these other aspects, and then you can compare those experiences that they have to other populations and begin to ask questions in social science research. But we, to do that, I think we need to understand more about the basics of games and play than we do right now. And the other question I have from a philosophical standpoint, I'm very much interested in the philosophy of games, is this just another postmodernist rationalist debate? You know, in science, they had this debate between is science a social construct or is it, is it a baseline rationalist activity? Uh, and here, it's the same thing, right? It's our games, this weird postmodernist kind of thing where people experience play and experience each other, or are they just an extension model of simulation? I don't know whether that's an immediate extension of that, but it sure, sure may be. And so the bottom line is I think war games are special. I think it gives you some reasons to think about war games are special. Okay. I think that they should be a separate category. They're kind of like the Burgess Shale fauna, and they don't quite fit into existing forms and clades of how we think about analysis. I think mixing them with other things weakens the impact of games and weakens our voice in understanding what games are. In addition, just because there's a cycle of research, games, analyses, and exercises, does not mean that they flow one into the other. Those are different things. They are different, they're done differently, they mean different things, they do different things. And so I don't think it's a, it's a, it, it certainly is a cycle of research, but the things around the perimeter of the cycle are buckets, not continuum. And so I think we see it too much as a continuum between analysis and games and less of different things. And I think we need to think about that. And finally, I think the most important thing, and this is the hardest thing I, I find to some degree for sponsors to do, is you've got to let the players play. Well, they shouldn't have made that decision. They just absolutely should not have made that decision. That was a completely wrong decision. Well, that is the decision the players made. Okay? It's not a wrong decision or a right decision. You need to understand why they made it and what the implications are, and maybe how not to make it again. But to invalidate the game because of the decisions the players made is a, a complete misunderstanding of what the game is. And I think that all too often in games, particularly as, as games move along this axis of importance and become cool, the cool kids are going to say, well, you know, this play stuff, this play stuff, it's, 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 it's a little, little out of hand. It's, it's not what we really want. We want the agent-based models of the world so that we can control everything. Because play is not really controlled. And I think we need to push back. Because I think that that's what games bring, even to Sandhurst or even to the United States Navy. They bring play. And in play, you discover things about yourself, about the world, and about the problems you're working on that you wouldn't otherwise know. And so I think that games work because of the narrative, the story that we tell ourselves in the games, as well as the fact that we play the games. So that's the bottom line. Thank you.